chapter on spinal mechanics. And uh, basically in 1918, there was a chap called Friot, Harrison Friot, and then he named the movement of the spine and he called it the laws of spinal mechanics. And he also dictated the position of neutral. Okay, because you think, well, what is neutral? Is spine. So neutral is basically the facet joints are not in a position of being locked in extension and they're not in a position being flexed and open. So they're idle between the two positions. So they're not, so if the facet joints are in hyperlordosis, you are not in neutral anymore, so they call it non-neutral. And if you are in flexion, you are basically in non-neutral mechanics. So the ideal position when you are walking, when you are running, will be that the spine will be in a neutral position. So that means that the sacrum will be tilted like we talked about, but the facet joints are not closed and they're not open, they're idle between the two. Okay? So when we are walking, which we'll do shortly, then it's easy in some respects from the foot up, which we'll cover, and the two innominate bones are simply anterior and posterior rising when you are moving. But the sacrum doesn't forward and backward motion when you are rotated. So when the legs are going forward and backwards, which is in the sagittal plane, the sacrum is rotated as the innominates are rotating forward and backwards. So they are working in the transverse plane on the oblique axis. Okay? Now, the sacrum is naturally tilted into mutation. And then if I was to simply hold the right axis here and just simply do, I can do two things. If I just do this, so I'm holding the right axis and I'm rotating the sacrum. Which way am I rotating? To the left. To the right. So I am rotating right on the right axis. Okay? If I hold this side, then I'm on, and I just go this way. So I am rotating the left on the left axis. Now, from osteopathic terminology, we tend to recall it right on right or left on left. So what that means is, is the first letter, the R is the rotation, and the second is the axis. So I'm rotating right on a right axis, and I come back to neutral, and I rotate left on the left axis. So simplistic wise, when we are walking, when we are running, it is the ability to rotate right on the right, and rotate left on the left, for you to be able to walk and run normally. Okay, but well, we're going to go through this. So the sacrum just simply rotates to the left on the left axis, comes back to neutral, and rotates right on the right axis. Comes back to neutral. The problem is we've got is, is that if the sacrum for some reason has decided to go back, okay, because when it goes forward, so this motion will be what we call forward sacral motion, because it is in mutation, so it's gone forward. So when it rotates this way, for instance, if you were to palpate the sacrum, which side is deep? Left. The left, which side is shallow? Right. The right side. And vice versa, if you palpate the sacrum now, which side is deep? The right side is deep, the left side is shallow. But either you have a choice. Either the right side has gone forward into mutation, or maybe the left side has come back into counter, into counter mutation. You don't really know yet. Now, the two physiological movements of the sacrum is this. Right on right, this is natural. Okay, this is what happens when we walk and when we run. When the sacrum rotates this way, it will induce the lumbar to rotate to the left. Yeah, I, I read that, but I don't understand. Okay, now, we don't need to explain it yet, but I will do it briefly. It's like the cog, if you've got cogs in wheels, okay, like a wheel in the cog system, then. So if you've got a like a like like in the watch, maybe not like this watch, but uh, you know, the old sort of like what, what cogs, um, cogs, like a watch. Like a grip. Why do you turn around on the side? 
Yes. Yes. So when a cog is turning this way, it drives. Mm -hmm. It's driving the other one this way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this one is turning this one this way, but then this one turns this one the same way as the first oh, one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the sacrum is the cog, which then causes the lumbar to rotate the other way, which causes the thorax to rotate the same way as the sacrum. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like the worm or the, the snake in the grass. Okay, that sort of movement. Mm. So when the sacrum is doing this, it drives the lumbar to do this, which drives the thorax to do this. Okay, so it's like the, the grass in the snake. The snake in the grass. In the, <laughs> the grass in the snake. The we'll come back to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Alright. So is that because the head's always trying to stay... Uh, vertical. So well, it's to do with, we'll, we'll explain why. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's a few reasons why this happens. Okay. Um, according, to, in my book on mechanic, I talk about another guy called Serge Grakovetsky. And Grakovetsky dictates this, what we're talking about, as an engine. So he talks about this as the spinal engine. Okay. And basically, he says that we don't need legs or arms to propulse, we can basically walk on our ischial tuberosities. So we can walk on our tuberosities, and he shows an amputee, I'll show you the video later, he shows an amputee being able to move, and he says the reason why he can move is because the spine is an engine, okay, hence the word spinal engine, yeah? But it's also the reason why these things happen is to do with facet orientation, but also the disc has what they call concentric rings, and where you turn one disc one way, you've got one lamella going this way, one lamella going this way, and if a circle, of, if a disc turns one way, one fiber will lengthen and the other fiber will slacken, and it's that sort of like lengthening, retracting, lengthening, retracting, that allows the movement. So the disc is part of the movement process, okay, but again, we'll, we'll come on to that. But remember, it's all initiated when you in, when you've got a gear, yeah. When you put it into first gear to second gear, it's like saying that the sacrum puts it in, yeah. And then you've got the second gear, which is the lumbar. You've got a third gear, yeah, which is the thorax. You've got a fourth gear, which is using your arms and your legs, okay, to then propulse you further. Things like that. So he calls these instruments of expression. So when the sacrum is able to to do this, it is simply rotating right on the right axis back to neutral. Rotating left on the left axis back to neutral. Yeah, but again, we'll explain that here. Yeah. Now, the downside is is that the sacrum can phys non physiologically get stuck in that position, but also it can get stuck back. So we talk about these as normal movements, but the sacrum can also be fixated in this position. So the sacrum can be stuck in a <coughs> torsion. So either right on right torsion or a left-on-left -left torsion, they can get stuck there. But again, we'll come on to that. Okay. But also, torsion. torsion. Torsion can mean two things. Like one, one says right-on-right -right torsion is the ability of the sacrum to rotate right-on-right -right axis, which is normal. Okay. But also, it could get stuck in a torsion position. So that means that this is normal for it to happen, but it's not normal for it to get stuck. So if you said you've got a right-on-right -right sacral torsion, it means it is fixated in that position. So, so torsion is torque. It's torque. So it needs to be <coughs> fixated. Um, in one respect. If you said you've got a, a torsion, then yes, you would. But then when you walk in, you can say it's the ability of the right to rotate on the right axis, and that would also be called a torsion because it's movement. Hmm. If it's fixed and walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's normal. That's normal. Yeah, but it's normal movement. Yeah, just it's normal. Also a normal movement. Yes. And if it is locked, then it is a different thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because when you pull it, it should be should be neutral. Now the sacrum can also come back. So, for instance, if I hold, which axis am I holding? Right. 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 So, for instance, if I tilt it forward and do this, I'm rotating 
I'm rotating right, right. On, the right. right mm -hmm. on the right axis. However, if I go back and I do this, left and right. right. So now I'm rotated left on which axis? The right, axis. the right axis. So this one would be poor, so we got <coughs> start being known as a left <laughs> on the right. Okay, and then the last one will be so if I'm holding the left axis, first movement, if I just tilt it forward and do that, I am rotating left on the left axis, okay? However, if I bring it back and turn that way, it is now rotated right on the left axis. Is that dysfunction? Dysfunction, okay? So this would be known as a posterior sacral torsion because it's gone back. What position will the lumbar spine be in? Flat, good. If the sacrum has gone forward, the lumbar spine will be held in extension. extension. Can you see already? So if you've got a hyperlordosis, <coughs> the sacrum has to be nutated. If you've got a flat back, the sacrum has to be counter-nutated. Okay? That is non-physiological. It shouldn't happen for it to go back. But you said earlier that if you palpate the... Uh, the uh, sulcus. sulcus. Yeah. Uh, it could be a, t a taut uh, multifidus, uh, yes. so you can't decide if it's actually shallow or not. No, uh, because of the multifidus muscle. Could you go down to the apex and yes. feel the function? Well done. Yeah. yeah, because if you've got the sacrum that is in what have I done, what dysfunction is it, or what movement is it? Right on right. Right on right. Which side is deep? Left. 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 Which ILA is up? Right. right. The right. Okay? So can you see you can palpate two landmarks? Okay? Now, if it's gone back, okay? So which side is deep? Right. The right. So it's not the right side that's dysfunctional anymore. It is the left side that is shallow. That has come back, but also the ILA is back as well, yeah. on the same side. Yeah, okay, so it's back. So it's not the side is deep, it's dysfunctional, it's the side has come back. So now we'll just take both of them. The, yes. The shallow, the deep, and the ILA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Won't, we won't know that until we've done a function. No, you won't know yet. Mm. Well, you could, you could have an idea by the position of your lumbar spine, because if the patient is prone and they are flat, in a spine, then you know that the sacrum has gone back. So when you palpate it, if there is a shallow side, you know it is the shallow side that is fixed back. If the sacrum has gone forward, then the lumbar is now <coughs> lordotic. So if it's lordotic and you've got a deep side, you know it is the deep side that's gone forward. So would you do a leg length test with that? Um, I'm not sure about the worry too much. Yeah, for that one, because it's more steak room yeah. rather than <coughs> in now, uh, now, when you're looking at this, uh, I just need to clarify a few things here. When you're looking at this, we'll cut, maybe, maybe do this first, so when I explain it later. Like this here, and the sacrum, if you turn, uh, have a look at where you can see this. I'm not sure what pages are, but maybe the page after. Oh. There's one picture there. So maybe turn to page 13 just for a second. 13. Yeah, just have a look at the one and two. Can you see the one and the two? Yeah. So what what shape? So this is the obvious the sacral side here. Yeah, but then this has a perfect, it's like the jigsaw piece fitting in the puzzle. On this side will be the innominate side, okay? Yeah, so then it's on there. Now, this is like the shape of an ear, so they call it the auricular surface. 